Hi, welcome back. In the last session, I tried to value Spotify. Did I make a lot of assumptions? God, did I make a lot of assumptions? But I ended up with a value of about 16 billion euros or about 19 and a half billion dollars at the end of the process. At the end of that session, though, I promised I'd come back and tie up two, three loose ends. And here are the three loose ends. First, I noted that IPOs are not valuation processes, they're pricing processes. The IPO game is a pricing game. What I mean by that is you make money by buying at a low price and selling at a high price. The value concept is in the background. So I said I'd come back and price Spotify instead of valuing it. You might have been mystified, but let's talk about it in this session. Second, I talked about valuing Spotify from the ground up. What do I mean by that? Spotify has 159 million subscribers. 71 million of them are premium subscribers. If you can value a subscriber, you could value Spotify from the ground up based on its subscribers. I tried this for Uber last year and I'm going to bring the same technology to try to value Spotify. And finally, I said I would confront the question of big data. Big data has been sold to us as an unmitigated plus and as we've seen the last week, there might be a dark side to big data, but there is an argument that companies like Netflix, like Amazon, like Google are accumulating or Facebook are learning about us and it's a, it's it's not it's a voluntary trade off where we've offered personal data to these companies in return for services they offer us and they use that data to tailor products to us tailor services to us and perhaps as a value to the big data so let's talk about each of these with spotify let's start first with a contrast between price and value we know what drives the value of an asset. The value of an asset is determined by its cash flows, the growth in those cash flows, and the risk in those cash flows. The technique for bringing them all together, at least one technique, is a discounted cash flow valuation, and you can value an asset. You can value a company. To price an asset or price a company, you've got to find what other people are paying for similar companies. Already, you can see some judgment calls need to be made. First, you have to decide what similar companies and assets look like for your company. So in the case of Spotify, who's similar to Spotify? Second, you have to decide on a metric that you price on. What do I mean by that? Price per share by itself is not comparable. I need to divide the market value by something. Number of subscribers, revenues, earnings, a multiple is just a standardized price. So let's start by looking at how instead of valuing Spotify, you could have priced it. And the two companies that come to mind right off the top as potential pricing comparables one is Netflix, that's your successful pricing comparable, and the other is Pandora. And as you will see very quickly, Spotify is going to talk as little as it can about Pandora and as much as it can about Netflix. Here's what I did. I went out and collected information on Pandora and Netflix. Not difficult to do because these are all both publicly traded companies. I got their enterprise value, which is the market value of equity plus debt minus cash right now for both companies. And that's in the first, second column. And then I collected information that I could get that I could use for my comparisons. Remember that both Spotify and Pandora are losing money, so that reduces their options. In fact, there are only three metrics I could potentially use in my pricing. The first is the number of users, and if I perhaps felt that I could do this, the number of paying users, paying subscribers. The second is revenues, and the third is gross profit. I collected that information for Pandora and Netflix. I also collected it for Spotify. You're saying, what are you going to do with this? To convert that information into a pricing, here's what I need to do. I need to convert the market value that I have for Netflix and Pandora into a multiple a multiple of users, a multiple of revenues, a multiple of gross profit. And that's essentially what you see in the, f in the three columns right next to the companies. The pricing multiples that I get by looking at the enterprise value of these companies divided by the number of users they have or the number of subscribers, the revenues they have as companies, and the gross profit as companies. So the, the, the way to read this is at Pandora, a user is being valued or priced at about $15.19. Let's stay with that number. If I take that number and apply it to Spotify's 159 million users, the value that I get for Spotify is going to be only $2.4 billion. If I took, take Pandora's revenues, the enterprise value to sales ratio for Pandora is about 0.77. Pandora's enterprise value is 77% of its revenues. Applying that to Spotify, my pricing for Spotify is a little higher, but still only $3.9 billion. If I take enterprise value to gross profit, the multiple that I get for Pandora is about 2.27 times gross profit. Applying that number to Spotify's gross profit, I end up with a value or a pricing of $2.4 billion. 
So you can see with Pandora, my pricing for Spotify ranges from about 2.4 billion to about 4 billion. If I use Netflix as my comparison, things start to look a lot better. Netflix is being priced at about $1,165 per user. If I apply that to Spotify's 159 million users, their value would be about $185 billion. They'd be more valuable than Netflix because they have more users, more subscribers than Netflix. If I divide enterprise value by revenues at Netflix, I got about 11.76 times revenues. Applying this to Spotify's revenues, I get a value of about $59.4 billion. And the multiple of gross profit that, enter, that Netflix trades at 34 applied to, to, to Spotify's gross profit, I get about $35 billion. So if I were to price Spotify based on how Netflix is being priced, the pricing that I get ranges from a low of $35 billion to $185 billion. Now, if you're a nitpicker, and you should be, you can see that there are differences between Spotify and each of these companies. Spotify is perhaps more successful than Pandora, less, more immune from the competition from Apple Music because it's more of a global company. Building on that theme, you'd expect then that Spotify should be priced more highly than Pandora, and perhaps that could justify a higher price, but it still doesn't give you how much higher. If you compare Spotify to Netflix, you could argue that Netflix has a bigger upper bound as a video streaming company and perhaps has less intense competition than Spotify does and perhaps should be priced higher. Again, you can see that with pricing, what you determine the price of a company to be will be very much a function of who you compare it to, Pandora or Netflix, what metric you use to compare it to, and what your biases are coming in. In fact, if you buy into the numbers that are being thrown around, that Spotify is going to be priced between 20 to 25 billion, you can already see that it's going to look incredibly expensive if compared to Pandora and incredibly cheap if compared to Netflix. One reason I don't play the pricing game is I'm not very good at these comparisons because the pricing game is built on mood and momentum. That's why I'm going to prove I'm, I'm going to stay with my intrinsic valuation. But if you're playing the trading game, be willing to listen to a lot of diverse opinion about what the pricing of of Spotify should be. Let's move to the second piece of the puzzle. When I did my discounted cash flow evaluation of Spotify, I started with revenues and worked down to cash flows. That's the way most of us are taught to do valuation. You could argue that maybe with Spotify, like Uber and Amazon Prime, we should be building the valuation from the ground up by valuing a subscriber and building up to the value of Spotify based on its subscribers. To do this, I'm going to draw on, an, on a framework I developed to value Uber and Amazon Prime. I'm going to start off by valuing an existing user at Spotify and value all of its existing users. Then I'm going to value a new user or a new subscriber value new, and value all new subscribers. And then I'm going to bring in the advertising revenues and the other costs as separate items to kind of tie up my valuation. So let's start with the first piece of this puzzle. To value an existing user, I start with the 2017 numbers. And in 2017, and note all of these numbers are in dollars, Spotify generated about $78 per subscriber as revenues. This is the subscription fees it collects. So that's what it actually reported. Its content costs were about 79.24% of those revenues in 2017. So I start with those numbers and I made projections. I assume that the subscription price would increase by about 3% a year, a little more than inflation, but content costs would increase by only 1.5% a year. This is actually consistent with the story I told my discounted cash flow valuation that over time, Spotify would be able to bring its content costs down. In fact, with those two growth rates, a 3% growth in revenues and a 1.5% growth in content costs, my content costs become about 70% of revenues by the time I get to year 10. I project out the income pre-tax per subscriber. Then I take a 25% tax rate. I used a global tax rate to come up with the after-tax income. And then I discounted that income back at a cost of capital of 8.5%, which is the median cost of capital for a global company. I assume that existing subscribers are safer than the rest of the company. On top of all of this, I also built in the fact that not every subscriber is going to stay on for the 15-year life I've given them. I took into account again what Spotify reported about its subscribers that a typical subscriber stay, stays on about that, that the subscription drop off rate is going to be about five and a half percent a year, which was a number from 2017 going forward. That's a critical number because it determines the value of a subscriber. So, with those growth rates, the tax rate, and that cost of capital, and allowing for that renewal rate, the value that I get per subscriber, per existing subscriber, is 108.65. 
you multiply that by 71 million subscribers, you get a total value of existing subscribers of about $7.7 .7 billion. So I value the existing subscribers. You're saying what's going to be different about the new subscribers? New subscribers are going to be less valuable because Netflix has to spend money to get new subscribers. To estimate how much they will need to spend, I took their total marketing cost in 2017 and divided by the number of subscribers they added in 2017. That gave me about $27.30 per subscriber. It's an estimate, but that estimate allows me to come up with a value of 81.35 per new subscriber and, allow, and I allowed that value to grow over time as well. And I made an assumption that the number of subscribers at Spotify would grow about 25% a year for the next five years and 10% thereafter. That will bring them up to about 279 million premium subscribers in year, year, year 10. That's a lot of subscribers, but this is an optimistic view of Spotify. You take the value of the subscribers, and I discount th these values at a higher cost of capital because this is a riskier component. I use a 10% cost of capital, the 75th percentile of global companies is my discount rate. The value that I get for new subscribers is about $18 billion. I've got the existing subscribers valued, the new subscribers valued. Let's complete the story. Spotify is an advertising business, which in 2017 generated about $513.6 million, $513 million in, in revenues. I'm going to assume that the content costs are going to scale down with this business just as they do with the subscription business. And I project out a growth rate of only 10% a year in the advertising business, lower than their subscription business, so it'll get smaller over time at Spotify. And I take the present value of the after-tax income from this business. The value that I get is about $2.9 billion. So I value the subscription business. I value the advertising business. Last piece of business is to take the cost that I haven't put into either of those other components. They have a GNA cost and R&D cost that amounted to $815 million in 2017. Those expenses are pre-tax, I allow for a tax deduction. I project that they will grow at about 5% a year. That's much lower than my revenue growth and my income growth. I'm assuming economies of scale. I take the present value of these costs, going back to the 8.5% cost of capital, and I get a value of these costs of $13.1 billion. So I've got everything I need to value Spotify from the ground up. The value of the existing subscribers is $7.7 .7 billion. I add on the value of new subscribers, $18 billion. I add on the value of the advertising business, $2.9 billion. I subtract out the present value of corporate expenses. I come up with $15.5 billion as the value of my operating assets. I add the cash and cross holdings, subtract out debt just like I did in my DCF valuation, subtract out the value of equity options. Again, everything is in dollar terms. And I get a value for equity in the common stock of $16.8 billion. This is the number you should be comparing to the market cap you will see for Spotify when it starts trading. But this is my estimate of, pre of, the, market, of the market value of equity you know, get with a subscription-based model. Incidentally, this value is about three to three and a half billion dollars lower than the value that I got in my DCF model, and there are three reasons. The first is in the subscription-based model, I missed the tax loss carry forward. Spotify is about $1.7 billion in net operating losses carried forward, which will give them a tax benefit, which valued in today's terms with a 25% tax rate is about $300 million. I should have included that probably will push up my value. I used two, only one cost of capital and I did my DCF because I had really no choice. A 9.24% with my subscription-based model, I used a lower cost of capital with, the, with existing subscribers than with new subscribers. And the third the third reason for the difference is a subtle one. In my DCF model, when I got to year 10, I assumed a 2.85% growth forever. In other words, I assumed a growth rate equal to the risk-free rate. When I did my subscription-based model, I stopped myself because the number of subscribers can't grow the, grow the inflation rate because it's, it's people. So I used a 1% growth rate, a lower growth rate. If I'd stayed with the 2.85%, that have added about 2.1 billion, I think the subscription-based model is making a more realistic assumption. So I feel pretty good about the 16.8 or $17 billion value for the equity that I get with this model. A different take, but the same fundamental principles. Which brings me to my third and final issue. It's a big data issue. Spotify is collecting information about us as we use its products. It learns from our playlists, it knows when we play them, it knows the songs we listen to, and the songs we cut off in the middle. It does have the pieces in place to take advantage of this because not all data is useful. 
Spotify's exclusive data, data it collects from its users, and it can use the data to tailor new products, new services, which presumably should add to its value. So you say, why should we add a premium for this? The reason I'm not going to add a premium is threefold. I think I'm already counting it in my valuation, and here's how. Remember that I allowed the content cost to come down and the revenues to keep going up to about $29 billion by the year 10? That's actually bigger than the total revenues of the music business now. I'm assuming that big data is what's going to allow Spotify to expand the size of the music business and bring content costs down. In other words, I've already built in a premium into my valuation. If I had another premium, I might be double counting. The second is, I think the more that companies are learning about us, the less the benefit there is to another company entering the mix. Let's face it, what's left of me that companies don't already know? Netflix is, 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 has learned everything I like about videos. Amazon, with its prime, knows what I like to buy and what I don't like to buy. Amazon Alexa is inside my house watching everything I do. Facebook is watching my social media to decide what it, where it should put me in terms of what kind of person I am and what politics I adhere to. There's not much left of me to learn. So I'm going to argue that with each new company in the mix, there's less and less of us left undiscovered and greater and therefore a smaller value added. I might be wrong. Maybe there are hidden secrets in each of us that will eventually come out. But I think most of us have exposed more than we should to these companies. And third, there is a component of a data backlash, as I said, that we've learned about in the last week. The Facebook fiasco shows you that there is a cost to sharing private data, that this is not some costless process for us. And perhaps there might be some buyer's remorse involved here where people are going to hold back. I'm not sure it's going to happen, but if it does happen, Spotify will pay a price. But if Spotify pays a price, Facebook, Amazon, and Google are paying, going to pay a far bigger price. This is going to be something we have to think about much more seriously and perhaps return to in a future post. Thank you very much for listening.